to uh, present a set of notes on the Society for Ecological Restoration's primer uh, for uh, ecological restoration, which was published in 2004. The primer, along with some of the other early documentations from the Society and early publications on the topic, for example, Restoration Ecology, a Synthetic Approach, by um, edited by uh, Bill Jordan, Gilpin, and uh, John Aber in 1987. These together form what I like to refer to as the uh, Restoration Old Testament. Um, the documents provide a strong foundation upon which all thinking about ecological restoration and restoration ecology um, can, you know, are founded. Um, but there is a great many ways of reading them and um, they and the discipline that emerged uh, over the last uh, generation uh, remains both controversial but maybe also the best hope for our conservation uh, future. Uh, there's a lot to say about the primer but I'm trying to keep my remarks uh, fairly uh, concise and merely just pointing out things that I think that you can afford to reflect on. It's a fairly personal matter for me. I've been involved in conservation projects in Ireland since the early 1980s, uh, particularly a project uh, in uh, national parks where um, uh, restoration volunteers, although the term restoration wasn't around at the time, conservation volunteers worked on the uh, protection of the last remaining Irish oak uh, woodlands. Uh, these would have been formerly part of a very large, uh, mainly contiguous uh, woodland that developed in Ireland post uh, the uh, last uh, glaciation. There is very little left of that woodland. It's been kind of human influenced, of course, but there are a few remnant areas where uh, the diversity is extremely high and they might indeed be able to trace their lineage all the way back uh, for certainly several uh, thousands of years. They're characterized by a high diversity of uh, bryophytes uh, as well as other uh, species, of course. The oaks themselves are a marvel, uh, very tenacious trees, even when they fall down, uh, very often they can manage to cling on, reiterating with um, from side uh, uh, branches to um, replicate the entire tree. The main uh, kind of disruptive uh, agent in those systems um, has been invasion by rhododendron ponticum, which was introduced to Ireland in probably kind of late, mid to late 1800s, and it can grow so impenetrably in uh, these woodlands and in other systems that it prevents the regeneration of oak woodland. Um, I had, uh, after I had left Ireland uh, in the 90s permanently, uh, it was several years before I returned to Ireland, and one of the things that I noticed, and I think this has uh, been a preoccupation of mine for a couple of decades now, was that uh, in revisiting some of the sites that we'd worked on so assiduously in the 80s, um, this year, uh, for instance, up in uh, Donny Gall in a national park, uh, just the discovery that uh, despite the best efforts, uh, this uh, invasive species had uh, reinvaded for complicated management reasons, but it is an important reminder that, you know, restoration while a promising management is also very difficult to implement and to get the results that one might like from it. Okay, enough of that. Let's get straight into the uh, primer. Uh, this is right from the beginning of uh, that document, Ecological Restoration, is an intentional activity that initiates or accelerates the recovery of an ecosystem with respect to its health, integrity, and sustainability. It's pointing out here, you know, the complex terminology that's already employed and complex it may be, um, but um, certainly the case that uh, some of these terms are uh, fairly hard to define, ecological health, integrity and sustainability just be, uh, being examples. So when you read this uh, document, uh, just be aware 
that it's going to call upon you to do some pretty deep reading on the history of ecology, the history of management, in order to really understand some of the theoretical and practical material that's at stake here. So frequency, frequently the ecosystem in need of restoration uh, has been degraded, damaged, transformed, or entirely destroyed as a direct or indirect result of human activity. You've got the entirety of a kind of the roster of human uh, impacts on the environment uh, to contend with uh, here. In some cases, impacts to ecosystems has been, have been caused or aggravated by natural agencies uh, such as wildfire, uh, floods, storms, or volcanic eruptions to the point that the ecosystem cannot recover its predisturbed state or its historical developmental trajectory. Here, a reminder that many of the impacts that humans impose on the environment are kind of grafted on top of uh, some of the natural, um, you know, habitual uh, processes that regulate uh, ecos ecosystems. So a couple of the key terms here that um, you know you will need to know a little bit about include kind of um, this um, you know complicated history uh, of human interaction with the environment resulting in degraded uh, systems. But uh, two of the terms that I want to alert you to on the one hand um, kind of this discussion of uh, ecosystems. Ecosystems, of course, are a type of system, and there is a huge amount of theoretical material that goes back on thinking about systems. Um, certainly, kind of the uh, scientific literature on this goes back uh, into the early part of the 20th century. But what we mean in general by a system is a collection of objects that are organized according to a plan and forming a unity uh, or whole. So you have uh, objects in a system that are interacting in a particular way, but according to a plan. Um, so the connections between these, these subsystems are kind of predictably repeated in space and time. Now one of the adages kind of that emerges from systems thinking is this notion that everything is connected. Uh, that classic uh, John Muir phrase, you kind of pull on anything in a system and you find that it's hitched to everything else in the universe is a instantiation of this notion that everything is connected. But uh, it's worth reflecting on the fact that some things are connected, but other things, you know, some things are more connected than others, let's uh, say. And very often your task as a um, restoration manager is to manage connectivity um, kind of determine when things are over connected and determine when things are under connected. More about that uh, at a later date. Another adage associated with the notion of system theory is that the whole may not be uh, merely the sum of the parts. Uh, so properties emerge. So this gets us into some pretty complex uh, ideas both in the sciences but also in philosophy. What is the no this notion of the emergence of properties? where you can detect properties at the level of the system that may not be kind of uh, immediately um, available for inspection when the parts are studied in isolation. So for, for instance, you know, water has properties of flow, it has properties kind of, it's a, when it's a solid, it's less dense than when it's a liquid. These are not immediately kind of, um, Kind of detectable in the properties of hydrogen and in uh, oxygen. Uh, it is worth, I think, as well reflecting upon the fact that though the whole may be uh, greater than the sum of the parts, as some people reflect uh, and say, it's also the case that you know not all of the properties of the parts are immediately in um, immediately obvious uh, from an inspection of the whole. So uh, certainly complex phrase but our business here is just the reminder that you know the ecosystem concept obviously is burrow burrowing deep into kind of systems theory it's a term that was uh, first uh, employed by Arthur Tansley the great uh, British uh, ecologist uh, who defined the term ecosystem in 1935 
where he says that the most fundamental conception is, as it seems to me, the whole system in the sense of physics, including not only the organism complex, but also the whole complex of physical parts in a wider sense. And these ecosystems, it's hierarchical concepts, it's a concept they range from the universe as a whole down to the atom. Uh, kind of a slightly more contemporary uh, version of it. This comes from Abram Melillo's uh, uh, book on uh, terrestrial ecosystems from the early 90s, where they define an ecosystem as the natural unit of a um, kind of is a natural unit uh, in a landscape, or of course it can be at multiple scales, but it's a natural unit that includes all the organisms in a given area that uh, interact with the physical environment so that when energy flows through the system, there's an exchange of, of material between the living and the non-living parts of the system. Now, I just want you to note that, you know, doing ecosystem ecology or ecosystem restoration, you know, very often has an uh, accent placed on function. And those functions include an inspection of, you know, the work that's being done by this energy flow. And a lot of this work, of course, is facilitating the exchange of material between the living and the non-living, um, and even the never alive in the system. So what we know, of course, is that uh, systems change through time. Uh, so the uh, term that we use for the change in ecosystems, which is often predictable, although uh, it's complicated, uh, is uh, succession. So succession theory dates back the late 1800s, but is kind of crystallized in the early uh, 20th century by Cowles and uh, others. So this is important, and I know it's, we're getting complex very uh, rapidly here, but restoration, you know, uh, according to the primer, uh, attempts to return the ecosystem to its historical trajectory. This is important because it's a kind of emphatic reminder that restoration should never be a notion of returning a system to some sort of static point, which is often the way of caricaturing restoration practice, that it returns it to a particular moment in time and freezes it. But in reality, restoration ecologists uh, think in terms of the historic trajectory, recognizing that things are changing all the time. Some of these changes are predictable. And so the historic condition can be an ideal starting point for uh, restoration, um, but um, it's easier to think in terms of restoring a dynamic over time, removing the human influence in a way that allows the system recover its historic uh, trajectory. Moving on, this is the kind of uh, technical uh, definition of restoration that the primer gives us. I think it'll endure long enough to be worth a tattoo to your business, but uh, the term will endure, this um, definition will endure, its ecological restoration is the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. And so, pretty clearly, based upon that definition, uh, restoration is going to be a pretty multifarious uh, business of um, attending to the health of an ecosystem that has been interfered by with by uh, human uh, forces. So I'm just reminding us here, I'm not going to linger uh, too long on this, but um, I think, it again, it's kind of an iconic uh, picture. This is from the book by uh, Jordan Gilpin and uh, Jerry um, and uh, Aber, John Aber, um, uh, where it kind of depicts restoration in terms of the species and the complexity of the system, but it also kind of thinks about restoration in terms of the recovery of ecosystem function. So this will always be the business of restoration, I think, is to think simultaneously about the structure of ecosystems, the species in the ecosystems, the multiple kind of um, hierarchical scales uh, linking genes all the way up to kind of a diversity of processes that occur in the landscape. And on the other hand, thinking about these issues of ecosystem function 
which emerge from the flow of energy through systems and an exchange of material between the living and the non-living. So, you know, uh, originally, um, you know, restoration was often kind of conceived as being um, kind of a return uh, of systems that were both low in species and, um, you know, poorly functioning back uh, to the condition of its original uh, ecosystem. Um, becomes complicated these days, as we'll see, because that task of discovering what the original ecosystem was like, recognizing that the original system was dynamic in time, because it had a historical trajectory, it was kind of a generally a successional uh, stage in the ecosystem that it complicates the task when you think about returning it to some original uh, point. More to be said about that, it's complicated. I want to just um, uh, go pretty quickly through what the primer uh, says about the attributes of, uh, of restored ecosystems. And I really like this approach in the primer because it reminds us that the proof is in the pudding. So if restoration has been adequately implemented, this is what those systems should look like after they have experienced uh, management in the form of restoration. So the restored system contains a characteristic assemblage of species that occur in reference ecosystems. The reference ecosystem is important. It can be kind of a historical reconstruction of what that system might be, or it could be a system that a um, manager regards as being a he healthy representative of a uh, system um, to which the degraded system might be restored, so a model system against which it can be uh, compared. Um, the primer also makes reference to uh, the um, idea that uh, it's not only the species that matter, the identity of the species, but it also includes the um, community structure, meaning the relative abundance uh, of species in that uh, system, something that we discussed extensively those of you who were with me in class when we looked, for instance, at rank abundance curves. This is also the place where I want to remind you that we are uh, in the embarrassing position as ecologists and biologists of not knowing to the nearest order of magnitude the number of species that there are on the planet. Uh, just think about that for a while. Restored system uh, is going to consist of indigenous uh, species to the greatest practicable uh, extent. In restored cultural ecosystems, allowances can be made for exotic domesticated species and for non-invasive, ruderal, kind of weedy uh, species and sagittal species, those associated kind of in mixed agricultural landscapes that presumably co-evolve with them. Ruderals are plants that colonize disturbed sites whereas sagittals typically grow into mixed with crop species. So key terms here you need to kind of um, think about and know a little bit more about it is kind of the notion of what is native to a region. What does that concept really um, uh, entail? Uh, we've spent a lot of time uh, during our quarter together talking about non-native species or exotic species or invasive uh, species, so we know the complex terminology on um, that. Um, and uh, there's a complex terminology for kind of weedy uh, species that you should know something about. So you'll recall from that uh, graph a few slides ago, kind of we're thinking both about the composition and the structure of species, but we're also thinking about function. What does the primer have to say about the recovery of function? all functional groups necessary for the continued development and or stability of the restored system must be represented or if not the missing groups have a potential to, uh, to colonize by natural means so in order to ensure flow of energy and exchange of material between the living non-living all functional groups uh, need to be represented in the uh, system and that requires a lot of attention on behalf of the manager, thinking about, you know, what those represent, uh, representatives would be, how do you measure the success of those outcomes. So the um, point number four, the physical environment of the restored system is capable of sustaining 
reproducing populations of species necessary for the continued stability or development along the desired trajectory. So again, an attention to function and a reminder that, you know, um, the uh, system can't be static. Uh, our notion of biodiversity is always going to include these kind of population level processes and even evolutionary processes that the manager needs to be able to uh, think about. The ecosystem, restored ecosystem, uh, it will function uh, normally uh, for its ecological stage of development and signs of dysfunction are uh, absent. Sometimes things that are very difficult to uh, measure and assess. Because biodiversity is a hierarchical concept going all the way up from genes uh, and certainly to landscapes and beyond all the way up to the level of the earth system itself, the manager needs to really reflect upon the uh, larger landscape context in which his or her uh, management is occurring. The restored ecosystem is suitably integrated into the larger ecological matrix or landscape uh, which, uh, with which it interacts through abiotic and biotic flows and exchanges, potential threats to health and integrity of the restored ecosystem from the surrounding landscapes have been eliminated or reduced as much as possible. And finally, uh, here is the restored ecosystem is sufficiently resilient to endure the normal periodic stress events in the local environment that serve to maintain the integrity of the ecosystem. And this is much harder to do, of course, than it um, sounds. The final kind of attribute of a restored ecosystem is that those uh, systems are going to be self-sustaining. So the restored system ecosystem is self-sustaining to, uh, to the same degree as its reference ecosystem and has the potential to persist indefinitely under uh, existing environmental conditions. Um, it turns out that that's probably you know, one of the most difficult things to achieve in restoration is uh, kind of walking away, restoring, knowing that the job has been done, backing away from the system with the confident knowledge that that system is going to continue to um, maintain itself. And it's not altogether clear that we have a huge number of examples, but there are some uh, of this self-sustaining ambition behind restoration projects. I just want to end with a few kind of uh, things to think about, sort of problems uh, to uh, think about it. And some of these are kind of uh, problems that were very uh, provocative and important in the early debates over restoration and to some extent have been um, resolved, but that's not always the case. The question is, you know, uh, when to restore it, uh, your system uh, to. So very often, uh, people will use terms like, you know, pre-disturbance. It's complicated because we now know, of course, that disturbance uh, is inherent to the very integrity of systems in the first place. To be clear, what I'm saying is that, you know, uh, disruption and, um, you know, uh, dynamics is part and parcel of the very makeup of nature uh, itself, so there may be no pre-disturbance. But if you say kind of uh, before uh, human pre-disturbance or before human disturbance, of course, it's complicated because, you know, a lot of the landscapes that uh, you might have an appetite to restore have a deep history of human involvement that goes back uh, to indigenous populations or, um, you know, to contemporary low-level use by um, uh, you know, com communities that have been in those landscapes for a very long time. Um, so that's a complicated issue. Uh, early in restoration debates, there was a suspicion that, you know, what was produced uh, by restoration was really kind of a type of forgery or a fakery that, you know, we were taking something, uh, destroying it through kind of human involvement over time. And then the restored, um, you know, the restored nature as a result of that investment of human energy into uh, kind of ecological conservation was producing a fake or a forgery. There's a thick literature on that. I would just suggest at this point that you um, maybe be aware 
of those issues and maybe um, spend a little bit of time looking at some of that earlier uh, issues. I want to get to kind of, and this is to wrap it up, like a final set of issues um, that are not easily resolved and that they, I'd say, are ongoing, um, uh, including um, kind of these tensions that have emerged between um, managers and uh, scientists. So it is often the case that, you know, um, uh, scientists um, are um, will have kind of a very different perspective on you know how to think about you know the uh, progress of management uh, will tend to um, kind of expect a wider array of variables to be measured uh, very often will place a different emphasis on managers than um, than um, merely looking at species diversity and the like. And very often, on the other hand, managers um, are kind of suspicious that scientists are kind of really primarily interested in kind of the pursuit of knowledge about uh, processes uh, where, um, you know, the slow pursuit of the accumulation of that knowledge will just slow down uh, the process of management. Listen, there's a lot to say about that, and I, I know what I'm saying here is a, um, kind of a little bit uh, complicated. I'll just give a quick example uh, here. This is uh, from a really wonderful book from several years ago about restoration in uh, Chicago. This is, a, is a, a book called Hunting Frogs on Elston where Sullivan says the Stewart uh, uh, local area, Chicago Stewart, had gathered about a dozen regulars who served as a sort of board of directors to decide what was done. This is in a volunteer restoration project. And they direct the efforts of hundreds who turn out to cut brush, gather and sow seeds, and assist at annual fires. They experiment knowledgeably until they find something that works, and the theoreticians can figure out why later. So this kind of sets, say, um, kind of up that kind of tension between kind of learning by doing versus kind of a more theoretical approach that the ecologists can take. Uh, in the most kind of recent um, kind of uh, book on restoration, which was impressed apparently when I made this uh, slide, this is uh, Falk, Palmer, and Zedler, uh, they reflected a little bit upon this tension. They say the importance of restoration ecology is a science. Uh, as the science that informs the practice of ecological restoration has increased dramatically over a relatively short period of time. The success and effectiveness of restoration practice can be significantly enhanced by ensuring that ideas and approaches being used are based upon up-to-date understanding of ecosystems and by being able to uh, learn from successes and failures in other systems and other parts of the world. So calling for a detente and a collaborative approach between managers and um, the uh, theoreticians. A final couple of things. There is kind of a growing sense amongst at least some of the restoration ecologists, some of the theoreticians, that um, you know uh, there have been too many empirical failures of uh, restoration. The restoration is not always fulfilling its uh, promise. Um, a version of this concern about empirical failure uh, is expressed in kind of very contemporary debates about, you know, how do we restore ecosystems when we can anticipate that the future is not going to look like the past at all. This is, of course, the meaning of the Anthropocene, the idea that there, you know, that the uh, future uh, will not be able to find an, a kind of an analog in the past. And how does that change then the way in which we think about uh, doing restoration? So most of the systems that we're restoring, um, you know, are not going to experience environmental conditions anything like uh, we did in previous uh, uh, centuries. So the very latest manifestation of this uh, has been in a series of debates over so-called and novel 
ecosystems and novel ecosystems are really kind of an amalgam of species that historically would not have been found together before um, you know because of changing circumstances because of human impacts on ecosystems but um, those species at the same time uh, can uh, function together in a way that produces certain valuable conservation outcomes and also provide a suite of ecosystem services that um, might be of real importance to uh, communities, uh, particularly, you know, when that novel suite of species and processes can sustain themselves with relatively minimal uh, management. These are debates that you're going to hear a lot more about in the coming years. I think some of the issues were already kind of outlined uh, as early as 2004 in the primer. Thank you very much, and I will see some of you again soon. Thank you.